Hello, everybody. My name is Natasha Lich, and I'm here in front of curatorial collective VHV and Kunsthalle Wien. And our speakers for this book lounge are with us. But before I continue, Andrea, maybe you just say how the technical part, please. Mm. Yes, hello. Uh, my name is Andrea Hubin. I'm also team member of Kunsthalle Wien. And I will um, moderate a bit uh, the overall chat and the Q&A um, that will take place in the end of today's evening. Um, so we will have a Q&A part in the end. Before that, we have um, um, three panels, three or four panels uh, interrupted with uh, small clips. And uh, we will, uh, um, so um, please um, get, and I will collect the questions that can be posted in the chat. So please feel free if you have questions throughout um, the meeting, post your questions in the chat and I will collect them uh, so that we can have them in the end uh, for the Q&A session. During the presentations or the panels and during the video clips, we would ask you to keep your video switched off for the moment and also to keep muted. Um, in the end, when we will um, also um, have the Q&A and the questions, you then feel free to switch on your video again and pose your question uh, yourself. Um, okay, yeah. And there I give over to Natasha. Okay, so thank you all who joined tonight for this uh, Zoom session. Uh, we were hoping, of course, that we will be able to do something in uh, physical <laughs> proximity of people here in Vienna, but then in, decided that it just makes more sense to stay on Zoom because everything is so very uh, complicated, obviously, as we know. And we gathered uh, for the book launch of the book called Shadow Citizen, that was published last year after the exhibition of the same title that we did in Edit Ruth's House for Media in Oldenburg. And it was published by Stenberg. And here it is. It's a wonderful book. And actually, all the authors of the book are here tonight with us on, the, on this Zoom. And this, uh, this book lounge is just a day after the opening of the exhibition, new version of the exhibition of the same name, Shadow Citizens, tomorrow in Kunsthalle Wien. And the book was done after the first version of the exhibition in Oldenburg, and in a way it expands on the exhibition itself. It adds some new facets to the central topic of the exhibition, which is of course the work of Jelimir Zilnik, and we kind of gave perspective to it through this notion of shadow citizens, <clears throat> or actually the, the form of political engagement that uh, urban theorist Andy Marifield calls amateur politics. And we speak about courageous amateurism of Zilnik in relation to his protagonists of his films, and also as a way of his political practice and as something that is a kind of red thread that runs through all of his films and that we think carries very important message for understanding the politics and imagining the future for all of us. We also use the exhibition and uh, this occasion to work with Jelimir as a way to look at the uh, political lessons of Yugoslavia, let's say, understood as a symptom of privatization and social processes that led to neoliberal capitalism that is scrambling in front of our very eyes now and what was happening in Yugoslavia and how it, it is about to happen and elsewhere as, as well. The exhibition also came about as a, as a, after a period, number of years in which we worked with Jelimir in very different contexts, we now and then we would show in different exhibitions some of his short films and our relationship to him grew over this and the invitation from Oldenburg was really an occasion that we could kind of give shape and voice to inspiration that we drew from his works over, over the years. 
from his works, from his political integrity, from clarity of his political position, and of course, from his artistic approach. Uh, and the exhibition and also the book in many ways also really owns to predecessors, to number of people who worked with Jelimir and who dealt with the subjects that his work opens. Uh, Kuda.org, organization in Novi Sad, who was maybe the, who was the first who really gathered extensive material and documentation on Jelimir and published it in a book called For an Idea Against Status Quo, ordered in 2009. And then also later a book uh, called Introduction to the Past with Boris Buden, who is tonight with us, did with Gilnik. Then I can also mention colleagues, uh, Gal Kirn and Dubraka Sekulic, who did the book Surfing the Wave and very instructive and important interview with Jelimir. Uh, colleagues like uh, Branko Dimitrievic, Yuri Meden, with whom we also now collaborate for the exhibition that is opening tomorrow, uh, Pavle Levy, and many others whom I maybe now uh, forget to mention. But why am I saying this? It's also because Jelly Michilnik has a very special position. He's admired across the spectrum of contemporary art and filmmakers and artists. But uh, in Yugoslavia, in former Yugoslavia, where he is coming from, uh, official, official cultural politics really neglected his work. It's very much. Uh, all this research, all this gathering of information, all this interpretation of his work and of its political consequences, all this was done by small uh, non-profit uh, institutions or parallel institutions and researchers. So it was really against the grain of official, basically nationali nationalist politics of successor states of Yugoslavia. And exhibition, I mean, I, exhibition is based uh, also, it shows number of Jelen Irzhenik's films, especially now in Vienna uh, that people can see. But it also contains maybe the core of, of the exhibition are expert, excerpts from various films of him that we used to kind of illustrate or accentuate certain of uh, certain topics or positions that Jelimir is dealing with. And this I'm mentioning also to stress Jelimir's generosity in allowing us to actually do this, to cut the parts of the film and show it in a completely different context of uh, contemporary art exhibition. And this generosity is also really uh, visible in a book because book also contains a number of a number of uh, descriptions of films that were basically done in a dialogue with Jelimir Zilnik, certain certain kind of oral history in which recounts how the films came about, how they were made, how they were financed, uh, and this and this this is really important part of the book. And then, of course, there are a lot, uh, the core of the book are commissioned essays by speakers who are with us tonight. Uh, Bert Rebhandel, who, uh, who wrote uh, about uh, Jelimir and his position within experimental documentary filmmaking on international level. Uh, Anna Janewski, whose text focus on performative practices in Jelimir's film. Diana Jelacza who talks about the politics of gender and sexuality in Zilnik film. Greg de Kuyr, who looks at the legacy of non-aligned movement. And we also republished an essay by Boris Buden, who, which was written originally in 2010 in magazine After All, which considers uh, ideological debates around the black wave, uh, the notion of black wave in the in 1960s from today's perspective and what is its importance. And it is really a pleasure for us to have all the authors of the text uh, of the text with us and also uh, Marcel Schwerin and Edith Molnar who 
are running uh, Edith Ruth's house and who invited us to make the exhibition in, in Oldenburg first and who are the publishers of the house and who actually really initiated this wave because also after Oldenburg we did a show in Gallery Nova in Zagreb and this is now in Vienna, the exhibition that opens tomorrow is kind of the last and the last version. So I would stop here with the, this uh, introduction and maybe we can now see the short film clip, uh, the first film clip that we want to also, we will have in between small panels tonight, we will have uh, small film clips. I am Želimir Zilnik, 28 godina, 72 kile, 166-167 visok, pravnik po zanimanju, bavim se filmom, imam jednu ženu, jedno dete, stan 48 kvadrata, dvosobni, vrlo nam je dobro, prosječni prihodi 200-300 hiljada mesečno. Ovakav jedan film sam već pre godinu, dve pravio, međutim ovih ljudi ima stalno. Thank you very much Natasha for this invitation for the panel tonight and uh, thank you so much for the whole project uh, that you created together with the VHV. This was amazing. And I want to talk a little bit about the initial idea that we had um, in the Edit Rus House to make this show with Jelly Mijilnik because um, we knew him from the festival context quite well. I worked for a while for Oberhausen and there Jelimi is really a legend. He's one of these figures that really made the Oberhausen festival that shaped somehow the way how film is presented there, how people are dealing with film, but we also realized that he's not that well known in the art scene, which is a bit sad because I think that a lot of his practice um, is very important for what's happening in the art scene, especially now. For example, his way to deal with documentary and fiction and always mix the two. And he was one of the inventors to mix these two things together to create hybrids of different forms. This was something which is very present in Jelimi Zielnik's works. He's one of the pioneers of that. And it's now very present in the art world. So like we all know, a lot of documentary filmmakers went into the exhibition hall, maybe most notably Harun Faroki and many others, many artists started to make documentary films. And we are always aware of the fact that we also want to have filmmakers that were originally trained documentary filmmakers in the art space. But now it shifts a little bit away from the documentary, more maybe to fictional formats. We can see this very well because we have a grand program where young artists or uh, mid-career artists send their works in and we see there's a shift to fiction, but they keep documentary elements. And this is something what Zilnik did all the time. And I we thought it would be very interesting for the art world to note this work to learn from it and to develop new ideas out of it. A second thing which now I think is very important in the art world is the way how Jilnik dealt with his protagonists. This is something absolutely unique. And when he started with it, there was maybe a wave to put amateurs in front of cameras to let an, you know, so-called real people speak non-professionals to give a voice to people. And the very special thing of Jelimi Zilnik in his oeuvre is that he never stopped it. So over decades he developed and then a really unique system of empowering his protagonists to make people that he documents to actors and at the same time to document actors and um, to make amateurs to professional actors and make professional actors look like amateurs, so more realistic. And in this way, he still continues to work. And uh, this we thought is also something which is absolutely unique and should be seen more in the art world. And then was the big question whether we create the show on our own at first, to be honest, we planned it very small and we thought, oh, we can do it ourselves with our knowledge. Um, but as we plan strategically to place his oeuvre somewhere else, we realized this is far a big to task for us, especially as we not that familiar with the Yugoslav cultural scene on the post Yugoslav cultural scene. And of course, also as we don't speak Serbo Croatian. So it was clear that we cannot go in the archive. And then we contacted the VHV and we were very happy and very lucky that they really 
were enthused about the project, went into the project, and they made much more than we expected because they not only made this really big book, much bigger than it was originally planned, and this amazing exhibition, but they're also, um, or you also made this online presentation of Jelly Mijilnik's work and renewed his website, which like you mentioned, was already perfectly done by CUDA.org, but now really brought on the state of art of Jelnik's oeuvre. And with these things, we now have the feeling that the ground is really made that everybody who is interested in Jelnik's work can immediately access it uh, from everywhere at the world. And this website, whoever haven't seen it, I highly recommend it. It's one of the best made websites for filmmakers because you can see really every film, you have a description, you have a lot of stills. And um, so this is something which was really fantastic. And maybe the last thing what um, I also wrote in this little intro about, or we wrote about, is this humanist aspect of Zilnik. And this was also something I wanted to write about, but then I thought it's maybe a bit too much kitsch. This was the personal encounter with him, um, which was quite amazing. Um, he is really somebody who lives humanism like I hardly know everybody else in every word he says and every gesture he makes. And this was a meeting or an encounter I won't forget for my whole life. This is where I would like to stop. Thank you. Thank you, Marcel. Uh, okay, I would like to invite uh, Bert Rebhandl, one of the authors in the book, who wrote, whom we invited to write basically about uh, Jelimir and his position within the international uh, context of uh, documentary film and experimental filmmaking. So, Hello and welcome, Bert. Thank you. And thank you for being included in this project. Uh, I have uh, followed Shelimir Shilvik for a long time. I am mainly a film critic, so I see him uh, predominantly from the perspective of a cinema expert, so to say. And uh, I see him also strongly in the context of world cinema, which is uh, the way how certain uh, theoretical problems of cinema or of the dispositive of cinema or of the conceptual aspects of cinema have been answered in different ways, but in similar ways in on similar uh, places uh, and times in history uh, all, over, all over the world. Like uh, the questions that Marcel has already posed or like the, the aspects that uh, found foundational questions for documentaries film making which is the position of the author, the position of the, of the viewer, the position of the director, is he outside of the uh, film or is he inside of the film? Does he have a stand-in in in the film, uh, which is one of the strategies that uh, Schilnik has? Uh, all these things, like is he, is he merely observational or does he intervene? Uh, and what is exciting about Schilnik and what is also, I think, in the end, uh, unique about Schilnik, that over the course of his very long career, he has basically found for all of these uh, aspects, different answers, which add up to a whole universe uh, of what I would consider the entire conceptual possibilities of documentary and even narrative filmmaking uh, in its totality, because he has really had so many uh, ways to uh, address certain uh, things, like from this first uh, film that became really dear to me, Black Film, uh, where he basically went out on the street and uh, took some homeless people into his apartment, which became something like a home movie, of course, uh, uh, intendedly so, but also a film that uh, uh, dealt very strong with uh, an aspect that was always important uh, for Schilnik, we can see in basically all of his films that he started out in a society or in a state with a strong ideological aspect. And it made him from the beginning somebody who wanted always to subvert uh, certain notions of dominant ideology, be it in Yugoslavia, be it also in Western Germany later, and being, be it in this system of uh, neoliberal global uh, capitalism that we live in now, which uh, goes uh, beyond uh, national borders, of course. Uh, and now with his interest, with his increasing interest in 
mi migrational experiences. Uh, he also took picked uh, a topic that uh, uh, again subverted this other uh, global globality. Uh, or to name only one other example, because we will have, I think, the opportunity to speak more in a little bit more detail afterwards. Uh, Uprising in Yazak, a film that I also very uh, like very much. Not all of his films, this is also worth mentioning, not all of his films uh, have a feature length. He also has uh, films uh, of medium length. He, he, he switches also very pragmatically uh, in format. Uh, Uprising in Yasak was a film about the dominant ideology in Yugoslavia, about the position of the state, of the future communist state, in the partisan war against fascism. And what he did, uh, Shilnik, is uh, something that he did in a different fashions uh, often afterwards as well. He was talking to uh, simple people, or so-called simple people, and but he just he did not just listen to them, but he conceptualized uh, their statements in a way that was uh, almost like a detournement. Yeah, he made he did something with it. Yeah, he he um, he edited it into a narration or para narration that again did something, uh, told something about uh, what he wanted to subvert about this idea uh, of patriotic heroism in uh, Yugoslavia at that time. And so he did it uh, throughout his career. He was always interested in oddballs, like in, in characters who were a little bit weird, maybe even. Yeah. But he always found, and I think this is a very uh, worthwhile principle, he found something uh, very, very important as, uh, about these people. Uh, I think he's uh, still probably maybe even the most underrated filmmaker in the world or artist in the world because. Uh, his impact is really uh, gigantic, but he's still uh, to be recognized, or discovered to a certain degree. And I think this book hopefully will be uh, a big contribution to that. Thank you for ha having me let be a part of it. Thank you. Thank you. Very much. And what do you think about, uh, about the idea of making an exhibition of a filmmaker? I mean, as you said, you are a film critic, first of all, you don't come from a context of uh, it's a very interesting question because uh, you have now become uh, part of the team who runs the Kunsthalle Wien, yeah? And the Kunsthalle Wien uh, have been following its uh, work for a long time, being uh, uh, a, a native Austrian and having lived in Vienna for a long time. And they did with, uh, with several filmmakers, they tried to kind of like bring them into the, uh, into the exhibition space. I remember uh, very vividly an exhibition about Atua Pelesian, yeah? being installed in this. Uh, and I don't think it always works very well to just uh, like uh, uh, bring a filmmaker. And I think Selim Yashili uh, still conceives of himself mostly as a filmmaker in the, in the, in the if we want to uh, have these uh, uh, systems, so to speak, uh, still. Maybe even like it's also important to, uh, uh, not forget that he comes actually from something like public TV, what uh, was very important. Yeah. And for Austrians, also public television is something that we all grew up with. It has a very uh, uh, immense impact, actually. And uh, I have not seen uh, the exhibition at the Kunsthalle yet, and I also did not uh, uh, make no. it to Oldenburg. So I would have to uh, look, I will look at it in Vienna in the uh, next week, actually, I want to go to Vienna to the Viennale. I'm very interested to see how you actually present his work in the space, in the exhibition space, because I still think this is a big challenge to do it in a way that is not just exploiting uh, something that comes from a different system and now becomes interesting for the art field that devours everything, of course. No, no, this is a big challenge. I'm happy you will have a chance to see the show. But that's also why at the beginning I mentioned how Jelimir allowed us really to work with his film generously. And of course he worked with us. Uh, I'm not sure that this would be possible. Actually, I am sure it would not be possible without this special generosity of, generosity of him. Do we have any question from the audience uh, at this point? 
Andrea? So far not. Um, yeah, as maybe I should repeat uh, just shortly that to encourage the audience to post, if you have qu any questions or statements into the chat and then we can we we collect can them. Also, yeah, thank you. And we can also, uh, we will collect questions and Andrea said, and we can, we will have a time for question and answers. Po vama Fidel Castro, nije ni trebao da silazi s planine. Po vama Lenin je trebao da ostane u Švajcarskoj, a Gorkić na čelu partije. Po vama Stalin bi još trebalo da leži tamo gde je ležao. Pa Trotski pored njega. Po vama Kamenjev, Zinovjev i Buharin ne bi bili na djubrištu istorije. Po vama bi Imre Nađ još bio živ. Po vama bi Hegla trebalo ostaviti da dubi na glavi. Thank you, for, thank you for the for the invitation. Um, well, there, there is a, a problem, you know, of addressing the ideological past and generally of addressing uh, not something we might, you know, call the context of Zilnik's work, but the, the problem is is much deeper. Uh, you know, there are I would I would say uh, generally two discourses. Uh, and both are marked by, by retrospectivity. First is, is the discourse of, be it a film history, art history and critique, which is some sort of particular uh, history. And uh, the problem it, uh, of, of, of this sort of historicizing and you know, of canonizing uh, Zilnik and, and his work is that it sooner or later ends in this quasi-dialectics uh, of exclusion, inclusion, marginal position, central position, or, uh, you know, some sort of struggle uh, uh, for recognition. And uh, we already uh, band, uh, mentioned it, that in the film history, Zilnik is underrated, so marginalized. But uh, what interests me uh, more is not so much the struggle for this recognition, but the, the relation of Zilnik's work completely to something we might call general history. And this general history is today not given. We cannot simply like look into the past. There is a work of translation needed to, to make this past readable, to make it understandable. And, uh, um, you know, this is, this is, uh, this was a major problem for me when I started to, to, uh, uh, to work on the book of, of Zilnik. I simply understood at the very beginning that I, that I cannot address simply the, the work because I first must, must deal with, with something like, you know, conditions of the possibility of the presence of this work, uh, dealing with the past, you know, how to, does, to translate something that was this traumatic history of, of former Yugoslavia, which is also, uh, you know, ideological, uh, the political, the self-management, non-alignment, uh, uh, non and how to translate it into the, something that is called today global theory or, or uh, global cultural memory. I don't know, but it looks like that. So uh, translation is needed. And uh, reading uh, uh, Edith Molnar and Marcel Schwierin's essay, I found that they have a good uh, uh, approach to, to this problem, to solving this problem, choosing certain concepts and work with these concepts. They have chosen the concept of humanism, which is definitely crucial for, for Zilnik. They also, also cho uh, chose the concept of critique and artistic pragmatism. And now I think I would add some more concepts, very well known to those who know former Yugoslavia, the notion of praxis, uh, the notion of alienation, and also critique. Uh, but the problem is today that these concepts, philosophical, you know, it, it sounds, this is, this is praxis philosophy. These are the 60s. This is the early works, precisely these concepts. How to translate it? And when we, when we mention humanism, 
how to translate this humanism into theory which understands itself as a post-humanist, you know, in a post-human world. This is an extreme challenge. But I think I found something, and this is so good to mention the notion to work with the concept of amateur. But I found the notion of amateur by Bernard Stigler, this French philosopher who died two months ago. This is, uh, 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 Stigler would say that every true artist and every true philosopher is amateur. Amateur comes from, ama comes uh, etymologically from amare, which yeah. means love. And this is, this is what is, uh, amateur is not simply someone that, uh, that, that, is, uh, uh, that opposes professionalism. It opposes consumerism, consumerist, consumerist uh, 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 approach and logic. And amateur is not about lack of knowledge of something. Quite the contrary, amateur knows how things are made, is in possession of savoir-faire. And this is Zilnik, you know, Zilnik, uh, um, I, I would say, you know, it, 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 as a humanist, he loves people, but there is a more. He loves a filmmaker in each of us, and he makes people amateurs, which makes, he helps them activate knowledge, you know, some completely so-called normal, non-professional people, you know, acquire knowledge of making films. So that this notion, which is very, very critical, and I, I would just to quote Stigler, who says, in the culture of amateurs, knowledge is a praxis, not a theory. And this, uh, I, I'm just like su suggesting that uh, working with this concept, there is a possibility to translate into today's theory uh, uh, concepts of praxis, co concepts of alienation, because I'm uh, repeating uh, amateur opposes the figure of consumer. And very much of the discussion when, uh, when it comes to the writing of art history, the problem is that this is the pers perspective of consumer, of, of those you know, who consume uh, 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 films, and then problem of commodity. However, if we take the, the, the perspective of amateur, we must differently deal with the idea of art history. So this is my introductory introductory intervention. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Boris. Uh, let's please, uh, I would like to invite Greg de Kuir, who is also tonight with us here and whom we asked when we, when we invited him to write for the book, the idea was if he can look at the notion of uh, non-alignment, basically, and Jelimir's rela relation to history of non-alignment and actually also how this history connects to our present predicament. So, hello, Greg. Yeah. Hello, thank you very much for the invitation. Hopefully you can all hear me okay. Um, I appreciate the invitation. It's always very much an honor to, to work on the, the films and the, and the writings and, and all the impacts, the various impacts of Jelimir Zilnik, who I'm proud to say is a friend and a very important one. And it's also very much an honor to work with you all, a uh, wonderful team from Behave. So I, yeah, really appreciate that. Just wanted to say a few things uh, about this piece that I, that I contributed to, to the volume that you all put together. And there's really two key focuses or foci that, that I wanted to, to deal with. Uh, and I did it through three particular films from three different periods in Jilnik's work. Uh, the first and the earliest would be Inventur, uh, Metzstrasse, which comes from the early 1970s in Schaden, Munich. Uh, it's a short documentary masterpiece that I'm sure a lot of you uh, on this call know about probably know a lot more than me even about it. The second piece that I focused on was a lesser known piece, at least now, called Black and White, uh, which actually shot in his hometown of Novi Sad. 
And this is sort of one of these transitional films that leads us from the 80s into the 90s, uh, which are two fairly distinct periods in his career. Uh, but Black and White for me is a really interesting bridge. And I'll talk about that film in just a little bit. And then the final film that I wanted to deal with is his recent work, uh, Logbook Serbistan, uh, which for me is a masterpiece. And this is a film that's really a central portion of, of the text that I wrote. So through these three films, I really wanted to deal with two particular topics. Um, as, as was just mentioned, I wanted to deal with the, the non-aligned movement and, and the legacy of the non-aligned movement. Uh, I wanted to talk about it in terms of its impact on Zilnik's worldview, keeping in mind that this was sort of the, the climate and, and the context that he grew up in. Of course, you all know he comes from the golden age of socialist Yugoslavia, I guess some would say. And part and parcel with that golden age was this sort of revolutionary and, and really unique uh, congregation of, of peoples and, and nations with Belgrade and, and Yugoslavia somehow at the center, sort of swirling this wonderful mixture together. So I wanted to talk about in terms of his worldview, I wanted to talk about non-alignment, uh, the non-aligned movement in terms of this residue, in terms of this heritage uh, for the contemporary moment, but also specifically for the ex-Yugoslav region, the former Yugoslav region and particularly as it relates to the global South, as it relates to peoples of color, as it relates to identity, as it relates to ethnicity, and sort of this non-European uh, point of view and way of living and way of being that has continually flowed through this region from that time to the present time. Of course, I'm thinking about the film Serbistan and, and its focus on uh, this contemporary movement, uh, in some cases, this forced movement of people from the global South through the Balkan corridor on the way to Vienna or some other beautiful places that people would love to go and live and hopefully find their happily ever after somehow in life. So I also wanted to deal with the original principles of, of the non-aligned movement. And we can sketch those principles out as dealing with one, mutual respect, also dealing with equality and also very much about peaceful coexistence. Uh, these principles are obviously really, really important. I would think a lot of us would hope we would live by those principles. Certainly people that are um, gathered here, I know a lot of the names and the faces, uh, some that aren't presenters. It's a really uh, distinguished list of, of, of participants. So I'm also honored to speak in front of you all. These particular principles, I could say maybe would be a preliminary sketch for Jelimir Zilnik's own politics, his own political stance. And I would also say that obviously flows into his aesthetics because we, as we all know, when we talk about Zilnik as an artist, as a filmmaker, his aesthetics are determined by his politics. So we have to think about his politics and think about his political stance and what that means for his aesthetics. So the second thing uh, that I wanted to deal with are the transgression the transgression of borders and sort of this idea of intervention. That was the next thing I really wanted to talk about in, in my writing. And regarding aesthetics, we can first of all talk about genre, which was already mentioned and already spoken about the way that Zilnik transgresses and sort of intervenes in this sort of slippage between documentary and fiction. So that's something really, really important. We can talk about a literal transgression of borders uh, in the sense of this flow of people, this sort of internationalism that he's very much concerned with, that he's always been concerned with. We can talk about his participants and we can talk about them as participants slash subjects, right? I wouldn't consider Zilnik a traditional documentary filmmaker by any means, but often we utilize this term sort of very liberally. So maybe we should deal with the fact that some would consider the people that they shoot in their documentary subjects. But obviously when we talk about Zilnik, we have to talk about them as participants, as co-creators, as amateurs, as Boris said, those that love and that contribute and that can become cineasts in and of themselves and, and definitely contribute to the final qualities of his works. And regards to that, the the ethics of, of, of many who deal with nonfiction, of many who deal with documentary, and what we could say the distance ethics, right? When we talk about classic documentary film, maybe observational modes, maybe expository modes, we talk about ethical stances that a lot of directors and filmmakers have, right? I'm not going to touch anything in the frame. I'm just here to witness. I'm a fly on the wall. Uh, I'm here to report to you. Uh, and that has different implications depending on where you're shooting, what you're shooting, who you're dealing with. But when we talk about Zilnik, he has never been distanced. He's always been an interventionist. 
um, he always likes to sort of get in the middle of things and hopefully impact and sort of uh, to make things for the better with his camera. But there's one particular moment in Serbistan that I would like to, to just elaborate on and, and then I'll stop talking. When we talk about this ethics and this sort of distance ethics that a lot of documentary filmmakers have, there's a moment for those of you that know the film, again, I'm sure a lot of you do, uh, near the end of the film when two of the main characters are close to the end of their journey. They're on the route to, to, to Hungary and they stop and they encounter a group of travelers from the Middle East who can't travel any further. They have to stay and they have to rest because one of them is suffering from an injury to his foot. And it's a beautiful, beautiful scene, not because they, they stop and, and, and talk to him and try to understand what his story is and what brought him to the point and what these tears mean in his face, not just because of the tears of pain and the tears of blood, but just the emotional toll that this journey has taken. But it's important to me because there's a very subtle gesture in this particular scene. And at one moment, we see a hand sort of reach into the frame. And that hand has a, has a bottle of, of, of salve. That hand has medicine in an attempt to pass this medicine onto the man so he can treat his foot, so he can treat his wounds. Um, that's a subtle moment, but it looms very, very large. I would say it's, it's one of the greatest gestures for me in, in all of his cinema and one of the most important gestures in contemporary nonfiction cinema because it deals with this ethical stance and it transgresses that sort of ethical shield that a lot of great directors would like to sort of structure around themselves and their work. I would like to think that it's the hand of the director. Uh, maybe it is, maybe it isn't. I've never had a chance to ask Jilnik, I will. But that particular hand uh, in Serbistan means so much to me. And I think it can be considered really a symbol uh, of, of his work and, and everything that he's about from politics to aesthetics and, and ideology and, and so on and so forth. So yeah, those are the things that I was interested in. That's what I wrote about. And I'm looking forward to discussing more and answering any questions. And yeah, hopefully I didn't take up too much time. Danke. Thank you very much, Greg. Diana Jelica, who will be talking in a bit, uh, she's also writing about a certain moment in which uh, Jelimir intervenes in the scene himself, also to expand on, uh, on his uh, ethical, but also political position and awareness. But this we will talk a bit later. Now I would like to invite Edith Molnar from who who will say a few things about the film that Edith Ruth's house commissioned for the exhibition in Oldenburg. Hello. Hello, good evening. Actually, I just thought to very pragmatically uh, draw the attention on this one particular film, which is titled Among the People, Life and Acting, because as the co-director of the Edith Ruth's house, and also we started to work with the VHV inviting uh, the Curatorial Collective to uh, uh, work with Jelamir Zielnik on this gigantic uh, exhibition. Basically, as a creator myself, also find it fascinating to see how uh, Jelamir Zielnik's pragmatism embodied in the way how actually he offered this incredible gift to the project. Because what happened is that while the VHV started to work with this incredible challenge, how this very diverse and really gigantic earth can be translated into an exhibition. Jelamir came up with this very generous uh, idea of producing a new film by commissioning and coming up, up with a, an absolutely uh, new production just for the sh shadow citizens. And of course, if you think about what does it mean in terms of institutional structures and finances and background, you can imagine that the budget itself was like uh, a petty cash of a of a real film production, but it's very typical throughout his whole work. Uh, he always wanted to be independent from any kind of financial um, restrictions and influences. And this uh, this gesture for an art institutions and for a, a curatorial um, team that he just says that while the the narrative of the whole exhibition is written, he will just make a new film. I think that was an absolutely mind-blowing moment in our collaboration. And also the way how he somehow made a, a parallel attempt to revisit his own uh, filmic earth from the perspective of the shadow, shadow citizens. Actually, his idea was to 
organize a performative event somehow to meet all the protagonists, hopefully uh, most of them he ever worked with, inviting them to his dacha and actually analyze through talks through what in their life this collaboration with the film director meant. And in the end, it actually didn't uh, happen in that kind of way, but it, in segments. And the structure of the film, the among the, the people, life and acting was, uh, came together from three different kind of um, filmic materials. One was the, the brutal way how he actually traced with his own films. He had excerpts, very, very short kind of statement like of excerpts within the movie. Then there are interviews, conversations of the protagonist he reached out and could meet. And also parallel to showing the interviews which described from the perspective of the protagonist, how actually this meeting with the film production changed their lives or how they actually could um, see their own lives through this collaboration meant. Giannik also made um, a kind of biographic footnote of what for a film director these encounters also meant. And uh, I just would like to uh, draw the attention on one uh, moment, which unfortunately we cannot see now, but as probably you know most of his early works, The Little Pioneers from 68 starts with uh, one of the most beloved character, Pirika, uh, Chako Piroshka, who um, was like a little teenager at the time when the film was made. And uh, the, the documentary of the Among the People starts with uh, uh, Pirika chewing a gum and 60 years later as an old lady commenti uh, like, um, uh, commentating her own performance saying that was the first chewing gum I ever got in my life. So it's an extremely touchy moment seeing the the really the umpire, the marginalized little kid being the protagonist of these couple of minutes. But at the same time, uh, Zielnik never actually pretended that their relation is equal, that there is not a very strong power tension involved in this kind of uh, protagonist and film director thing. So what he actually now in the new documentary, the way how he cuts this excerpt is when he just shouts on her while she's singing and saying cut, director's cut. And I find it that was a moment of starting a new documentary from this very brutal gesture, extremely mind blowing because we also feel that all his films are full of with this tender love towards his characters. That's why actually I consider this documentary as a love letter also to the protagonists. But at the same time, the way how he inscribes himself as a director into this movie by looking back is also extremely revealing and extraordinary. So from the, the way how pragmatically he wanted just to create a film, which was uh, autobiography at the same time, the biography of a lot of the protagonists, I find it extraordinary to include this for your first show. Yeah, it was also really in the context of the whole uh, amateur politics uh, as, a, uh, as a background against which we worked with the notion of of shadow citizens, it really exemplified this kind of relations and his very long engagement with people with whom we were, he worked. Yeah, thank you. Thanks a lot, Edith. Uh, I would like to ask, uh, you know, the book, the, I would like to ask Boris something. The book uh, opens with the one of the amazing quotes of Jelimir. He says, I make movies because we are still not in communism. I make movies to warn about how many things we still need to do in order to get there. I'm not interested in art film. And, I, and in your text, Boris, you are actually in relation to black film, you are talking about this. You are saying what is black in black film is actually art itself or more specifically socially engaged art. And again, it goes from it comes from Jelimir being uh, pro also protagonist, being the one who expresses this uh, himself in a film. Uh, can you expand on this a bit, Boris? Please? Yes, um, uh, definitely. Uh, this is uh, that he makes films uh, 
because the communism has not yet arrived means simply that he he, he wants to change the world and this 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 is the discourse of the of the 60s and it is not some sort of uh, you know art with a task to change it is something much deeper something for which we need the notion of equality which is now in this crisis when the system system that established itself uh, after 1990 uh, promising to be forever here is now collapsing this concept the concept of equality that has actually shaped our political modernity is returning you know on all the levels of politics but it is not now what what i already said uh, to understand Zilnik's uh, work as a filmmaker uh, it is not only about you know hermeneutically put putting him into a certain uh, historical context so that we can reconstruct this context. No, it is about the presence, present. It is about uh, understanding equality now. So um, Zilnik will make films until the communism arrives, but there is no other option for, <laughs> for communism because uh, uh, the, the, the victorious side after 1990 is, is now uh, in a deep, deep crisis and we must search again precisely. And this is now why Zilnik is important. Beyond any sort of recognizing him as an import, important filmmaker, you know, rewriting film history, and we know it. There will be and there are many on, of his colleagues, filmmakers who never, who have never taken him seriously. You know, who have never, who would say that he is not proper professional filmmaker. Um, so this struggle for recognition will be always lost, but it is not about this. It is about much more. This is why he is important. When you talk about, uh, when you talk about uh, equality, uh, I want to ask Greg, you are writing, uh, when you write about logbook service, you are also mentioning the collective transnational labor. You are talking about certain scene when people from, in relation to non-alignment again, when people from di different places work together. And you say that uh, for Zilnik is that just how it should work. That's how it should be. And this is then really going beyond the presentation of migrants. So can you tell us uh, more about that, uh, Greg, please? Yeah, thank you for the question. That scene happens uh, at the beginning of the film, at the beginning of Serbistan, uh, after the two main characters are introduced on a bridge overlooking a river, or not really a river, I guess, sort of a floodwaters. For those that remember, I think it was 2014, these great floods that we had in Serbia, but also uh, there was a lot of rain and a lot of in, in the region at that time. So there was a lot of damage, a lot of houses got swept away, and there was a lot of work that needed to be done. There was a lot of reconstruction that needed to be done. So the early scene in the film, this this first scene in the film is is really beautiful because it depicts this act of work. It depicts these these local people. Uh, mixed in together with with migrants that are coming from all over Africa, coming from the Middle East, uh, coming from from Asia in some instances, and showing them building something together, or maybe, well, yes, building more importantly, clearing something out, getting rid of something. Uh, maybe to go back to this idea of 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 this shift after 1990, sort of clearing something away and hopefully making way for something new to be built and, and to be constructed. We can read so many things into that particular scene, this idea of collaboration, yeah, collective work, this idea of, of, of multiple nations and, and peoples coming together to literally build a better Europe, hopefully, um, whether we talk about continental Europe or European Union as, as a political sense or, or a number of, of member states. So this particular scene, and, and this vision of work obviously connects also to some of the concerns of, of Zilnik's earlier films 
uh, from the time of socialist Yugoslavia and how they sort of dealt with work or lack of work in some instances, whether we talk about the unemployed, whether we talk about black film, whether we talk about inventor for that matter. Uh, it's a really, really important scene. It's, again, it's just one of these other reasons why the film is a masterpiece, but it also, yeah, sets the stage to, to, to introducing us to, to modern day Serbia and what these migrants, what these travelers are sort of walking into. Some of them stay, some of them leave, some of them have to go back. Um, but this transitional space uh, where anything could be possible and should be possible, I think it's hinted at in, in that first scene of, mm. of collective labor and, and, and what it stands for. Thank you, thank yeah. you. Uh, I would like to invite Diana Jelača who wrote about uh, Zilnik as explorer of politics and gender. Hi, um, I, I, I thought we could hear from Edith, but maybe in the discussion, uh, we talked to Edith uh, because I was going to lean on uh, something she said as well. Maybe, maybe you can join us if it's okay with you. Um, should I speak? Should I continue? Yes, please. Okay, thank you. Uh, and like everyone already said, thank you so much for having me. And I was uh, uh, privileged to be part of this book. I also want to show the book once again. I got my own copy and to highlight that it's really an, an amazing collage that has not just our essays, but amazing images and quotes from other existing scholarship on Jelimir, important quotes from some people who are in the audience here today as well. So, uh, as uh, Natasha mentioned in, the, in her introduction, um, my essay is called Double Binds, The Politics of Gender and Sexuality in Jelimir's film. And that's in films, and this is generally um, a, a more broadly an area of interest for me. And not just with Southeastern European film, but more broadly, feminist historiography, gender uh, and sexuality and so on. So um, in, uh, in my essay, I kind of gave a little overview. I didn't focus on any one film uh, in great detail, but I kind of uh, tracked the trajectory of Jelimir's uh, work when it comes to women um, and representation of women and collaborating with women. So only when I got the book, I actually got to read the interview that the Have uh, Collective did with him as part of the, uh, I assume the original retrospective. And I uh, and so uh, this is only after the fact of me writing this essay. And I saw this really interesting quote where asked about women in his films, Jalimir says, there are fewer female characters in my films that uh, than I wanted. Um, so that for me was very interesting because um, I would want to talk more to him about this. Um, and I would also venture to say that the ones that are there count in important ways and um, that, that the way th in which they count shifts over time. It's never one simplistic or repetitive, obviously, form of representation. Um, and he also adds that he finds that uh, women's experiences to him are often more interesting to engage with, uh, to participate in, in putting them on screen uh, and representing them because I, he says something along the lines of women are always fighting on multiple fronts and societal expectations imposed upon women often amount to what, what I think he called mission impossible. Um, so this is precisely what the double binds in the in the title of my article referred to um, uh, in, in this humble contribution that I gave. Um, since women in his films most frequently are working class women or, or um, women who are um, often invisible to society, rural women and so on, the double structures that bind them are those of both socioeconomic uh, precarity and of patriarchy. So this is what I focused on. Um, I also wanted to emphasize that I don't treat any of these concepts to lean uh, on Boris's uh, focus on concepts, gender, sexuality, women, and so on and so forth as homogenous, stable, unchanging categories that are uniform in some way that always mean the same thing for everyone and everywhere. Um, nor are they actually approached in this way in Zilnik's work ever, uh, which is one of the most interesting and important aspects for me to analyze. So um, uh, throughout the essay, my focus is illustrating uh, uh, with several key examples um, uh, across historical, social, geographical, geographical, cultural periods, a keen attention 
the Dzhelimir shows to the ever shifting and intersecting, this is for me an uh, important term, political domains of class, identity, gender, performativity, and performance. And I know Anna is going to talk more about performance and for, for us that's an interesting overlap between our essays. And also, um, uh, Zilnik uh, often uh, frequently points out um, the political dimensions of gender and sexuality, particularly as they intersect with the contingent social and cultural, cultural issues of the specific locales and time, because he has been making films over a long period of time. So these issues do change over time. Uh, Little Pioneers was already mentioned, um, and Pirika is in that film, like she is in early works as well and in his later works. Um, so for me, this is a really interesting trajectory of a collaboration, really, uh, a, a bottom-up collaboration between the two of them and friendship, um, I know. So it's incredibly moving um, to kind of witness that in film being documented and that story being told through film as well, the collaborative nature of their relationship. She first appears as a young girl, as a teenager in Little Pioneers, um, and in this film, and that is the, the example of what Natasha was, was referring to, where I also talk about the director kind of revealing himself in the film. Uh, Jalimir has revealed himself in his films many times, is a, reminding us of himself as the filmmaker. But in this case, from the perspective of gender and representation of women, it comes at a really critical moment in the final chapter of that short, which is kind of also separated from the rest of the film. Um, as the next chapter, when we hear this harrowing story of a young woman and uh, experiencing sexual assault. And suddenly her story switches to voiceover narration. As we see Jelimir entering the frame and she's facing him and he's giving her the action um, a, a couple of times. So he's kind of there uh, reminding us of his position behind the camera of an adult man, male director, listening to the story of a young underage girl and the harrowing experience that she has gone through, which I think is a really powerful moment. Um, Pirika already talked about and her role in the early works is important as well with Yugoslava, her older sister giving her the apple, the bite of the apple as she leaves the home. So I discuss Yugoslava as well and her much analyzed violent demise. I don't want to get into detail here, maybe there will be time in the discussion to talk further about my take on this. Um, but I want to say that the frequent backdrop to Zilnik's treatment of gender politics is the working class milieu, um, fraught inter-ethnic borderlands uh, to this day, and also uh, particularly in this uh, uh, latter period of his work, transnational movements of people, particularly for economic reasons. And this is um, not just in the most recent work, uh, Brooklyn Gusine is another, speaking here from Brooklyn, um, is another interesting example of that. Um, and uh, uh, it's a TV movie. And there's a really amazing quote uh, from Jelimir in the book as well from one of his interviews about his um, attitude towards working in television and how that may be um, a medium in which he found more freedom at certain point. And in fact, feminist historiography and feminist film studies have found that that's been the case very frequently for when many women filmmakers, but also uh, as a platform for representing underrepresented stories that otherwise don't find their space in movies. So I uh, finish my essay by focusing on another recent documentary of Jelimir's from 2011 called One Woman, One Century which focuses on Dragica Vitolovic Srezintic, um, who's about 100 years old um, at the time of the documentary's making. And so we get the story of, this, of the uh, 20th century or the beginning of the 21st century from this woman's perspective. And we get the history or the story of Yugoslavia through the perspective of a woman who actively participated uh, in socialist activism in the 1930s uh, in um, the people's liberation uh, struggle um, and uh, who's at some point went through many trials and tribulations. And interestingly in that film, often when she's narrating her story, um, um, it, it is interrupted by block letters um, that spell various famous male names of Yugoslav socialism, including um, Josip Broz Tito. Um, and so I don't see that as 
their names interrupting her story. I actually see it as the exact opposite. I see um, uh, Dragica's story as interrupting the largely male-dominated story of the experience of, of uh, uh, Yugoslav socialism. So I thought that was a really incredible and important intervention as well. So I will end here. That's just a little summary. There's a lot more to say, and I look forward to questions and elaborating on these and other points. Thank you so much. Thank you, Diana. Thanks a lot. Uh, I would like to invite uh, Anna Janewski. Hello, Anna. Hello. Whom we asked to write about uh, a certain, a certain choreographic, performative moments that we kind of observed when we watched the Zilnik films over a, in a condensed way over very intensely over several months when we were preparing for the exhibition and first time noticed this and also in relation to pop culture and so thank you Anna for being thank here. Thank you, I, of course I would like also to thank you all and it's all such a pleasure and such an honor to be part of this uh, project. And that's true what Natasha just said. I, my initiation to Zilnik was through the cinema clubs, through the whole notion of the amateurs, amateurism, like not only through the cinema clubs, with his activity in the youth tribune in Novi Sad. And then when uh, they have invited me to write, Natasha and I had this like long conversation about this performative aspect or somehow this like kinetic aspect in, in Jelimir's uh, characters. The fact that they're always moving, there is always some kind of a movement, there is music, there is speech, the dynamic of the body is very specific. And we were asking what, what does it mean? So I also started to look the films with a different lens in a way and trying somehow in my essay to make a connection between those ki kinetic movements, this idea of performativity and the Yugoslav social like political dynamics and, and, and system actually. And there is the scene um, in the film, in the newsreel on village youth in winter, and that's how I start my essay, which was like particularly interesting and was somehow really a prompt to think further. And it's this moment when you have a young people dancing in a, in a dance hall with like a band playing pop music. They're like moving in a, in a kind of a pop rhythm. It seems could happen almost everywhere else in the world at that moment, we are in, in 67. And then there is this like imperceptible moment when things are shifting, when suddenly the band starts to sing a, a folk song and uh, the youth and Zilnik is also filming their, their, their legs, their feet started to, uh, to dance a kolo, a folk, a folk dance in a, in a circle. So this like embodiment of the rock and on the folk at the same time. And it's really the, the shift is, is such an incredibly mastered uh, in a film was really an important uh, moment for thinking about the essay and about this, uh, those issues. Because in a way, so you have a rock, which is uh, a symbol at the time of transformation, of modernity, of progress, but you also have fol folklore and it's called, which was also called socialist folklore, which is also accepted by the, the, by the politics of the time, because it's also a way to get the mass together. And this, this coexistence, Zimnik don't doesn't see them as kind of a clash or contradiction. Because for example, I, in, my, in my SM, I'm quoting the Yugoslav like creation uh, writer, Miroslav Krleža, who talking about Tito Yugoslavia, he talks about this incomparable cultural development that happened in Yugoslavia, but he's very afraid and worried about the fact that there is, there is no emancipation from the nationalist myth. And he exactly said that it's important to leave Kozerac Kokolo, so this folk dance behind in the past. And Zilnik is not so assertive. He's aware that's not really possible or that's not really what is happening. And he's aware of this paradox and Branislav Dimitrievich in his earlier works, in his earlier essay talks really very brilliantly about this idea of the paradox, this idea of a non-dual truth of the uh, sy synthesis of opposing assertion. And that's why the title of the essay is like a dancing paradox. And so the embodiment of those like rock and folk of this paradox is also happening in bodies that are not 
uh, that are not disciplined, that are undisciplined body, that are not regulated body, not institutionalized bodies. So the shadow citizens that we were just talking about, that is actually the whole theme of the project. And also because the newsreel in the village youth in winter, it's not about some exemplary socialist youth has, like having you know leisure time, but it's a very non-sophisticated, he's showing this like non-sophisticated youth, the way that actually we wouldn't be proud, like the, the, the politics of the time, the ideology of the time wouldn't be proud of this way of, of spending somehow leisure time. And I think uh, as for some reason, little pioneers are coming back uh, again, because this is another example that I've given, another example of youth of those uh, younger, uh, younger children, basically neglected children who are pickpocketing, banging, or doing any kind of illegal uh, activities, again, opposite of the happy and hair carefree image of the young socialist pioneers. And they're always, always in motion. Diana, Diana just gave really uh, an important like framework about the gender question there, but they're also constantly in motion. They're like running, they're moving, they are like singing, wailing, screaming, shaking objects. But there's, it's not about the vitality. It's not the vitality about the young uh, bodies, but it's more showing certain systems, certain, certain symptoms, sorry, symptoms that actually are problematic. There's something darkness in that about why those young, young, very young actually children are in these conditions which they are. And then it was important to somehow jump into the uh, later films in the 80s. And actually there were so many films that we could have, I could have like analyzed, but uh, going through uh, all the films that jump in the 80s seemed important, like the leap in the 80s and the films done for the TV after uh, Julnik returns from Germany. And in particular, the first uh, three master of uh, Pavle Chromisch seemed important because this whole idea of the gastarbeiter, it's important. The gastarbeiter is another, it's another maybe paradox of someone who doesn't fit in Germany, doesn't fit in, in Yugoslavia at the same time. It's a, a very particular uh, figure that has been, uh, um, that, that, that has been elaborated by Zilnik in so many uh, films. And so Pavle is coming back from Germany after spending 11 years with his parents, living with his grandmother. There's like a generational clash and this generational clash is happening also in the previous films and he decided to go to board school. And uh, in, in again, like there is a group of, uh, group of young people, like teenager this time, who are again in a constant move. They're racing, like Pavle is even uh, jumping from one train uh, to another. And what it happens with, uh, uh, with, um, with Pavle is that he decided to, be, uh, to join the military because he needs discipline. So there is like the fact like of having this duality of being in this paradox, it's too, it's too, um, it's too difficult to deal with. So he needs discipline. He becomes, uh, decides to become a military. And so he the, his body is going to be disciplined. And there is this moment of the, um, of the everyday ritual, everyday military ritual in the film, which is accompanied by the tune of uh, Gang of Four and which is actually talking about exactly the military life. So what was interesting as somehow closing the circle of this uh, trajectory, it was this idea of the body who is disciplined, but then we have punk and socialism cohabiting at the same time, which then would lead basically to the dissolution of the system. So this is my this is my essay summary of my essay. And of course, as Diana said, there were interesting overlap when I read the book. It's almost as we are com complementing each other in in this uh, in this in, in this way. Almost she's like finishing, I'm continuing, and it feels that we could go on uh, about that. And, and we, but we didn't read each other's essays no. until they were published. Yeah. Yeah. So the editor did a good work. No, but this was also really. It's true. I mean, it's, it, 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 it really did happen. But uh, one of the idea of the book was how can we also discuss Schilling work and touch on certain aspects that were not that much discussed before. And performativity and gender politics are definitely, uh, and maybe also the relationship to modernity and pop culture and folk culture. These things were really not 
uh, so much present. I wanted to ask you, Diana, just, uh, it's not a simple question, but basically the argument, what you are developing in your essays uh, that Zilnik approaches his uh, women characters uh, from a position that there is no socialist revolution without abolishing patriarchy, and that this is kind of the main, the main, the main thrust of his uh, approach to women. But in the end, also Yugoslava, the character of early works, she's also meeting her death really violently, really tragically. Uh, what do you think about this uh, fact of presenting femicide in the film from that position of no revolution without without abolishing patriarchy? Patriarchy, and that and that um, Yugoslava actually. Uh, utters those words, uh, I think, quoting Clara Tsetkin in the film. Yeah. Um, and uh, it's one of the most powerful uh, moments in the film, as is the moment where they're traveling through the countryside and she's actually speaking to the rural village women and showing them different forms of contraception. And those questions are so genuine and so unrehearsed um, um, uh, 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 that, that one has to, that one feels it almost on a visceral level. So speaking of that visceral level, I have to say that my reaction to that ending is always a visceral uh, on an affective level. It is really difficult and disturbing to watch. Um, and uh, uh, is, was it inevitable? I don't know. Um, but I think within the framework of how the film positioned the critique of the promise of the revolution that these young people still sort of believed in and how how it can be um, um, betrayed or, or, or lead in, in, in misdirections that are not um, to the um, uh, 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 to the benefit of said revolution, again, has to do with the increasing uh, and more volatile gender dynamics in the film, more and more violence happening towards Yugoslava, uh, 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 initially from uh, the villagers who are beating up all of them at some point, and, and then she's the one who I think the inference is, experiences sexual assault as well. Um, um, and then from her comrades, uh, increasingly so. So while they're still nominally fighting for that said revolution, they are, they're not even realizing that they're betraying it through the way that they're treating her uh, because they are exactly doing the opposite of what she said uh, would guarantee, would be, have to be one of the elements, crucial elements that would guarantee such a revolution to actually succeed. So in that sense, because once her comrades um, betray that and start to treat her uh, more and more as sort of a nuisance or or some someone who needs to be punished uh, because she's not behaving a certain way that is being expected or or who who knows what individual reasons are um, in in a way uh, her death becomes uh, uh, inevitable uh, on a symbolic level I would say even though it is ex extremely disturbing. And if I could just connect again to the question of, uh, just briefly to the question of movement that both Anna and I were talking about, I actually um, um, use this um, as, a, as, a, as an important point and as an important uh, theoretical um, source for, for how I'm approaching this. And this is Pavle Levy's uh, recent um, um, uh, work um, in Jolted Images, where, where he posits some of the, to my mind, some of the most poignant things written on Jeremy Zilnik's work, where he leaning on uh, Marx's 11 Thesis on Feuerbach says, um, uh, the filmmakers have only reproduced or represented the world in various ways. The point, however, is to produce it. And, and Pavle, who I think is here, um, then links Jelimir's work to exactly producing the world, producing unexpected movements, torsions, and ruptures in the social fabric and to inspire the forging of some novel, often improvised and only temporary communal bonds that are transformative. And that's really important that imagining that becomes real even, even briefly uh, with respect to gender and sexuality and the treatment of women uh, in revolutions and otherwise, um, that becomes the reality even temporarily in, in a lot of films of Shalimir Zilnik. Thank you. Uh, this is what I asked about Yugoslava. I also just want to use this opportunity to announce that we will have uh, as a part of the public programs for the exhibition also a session 
of Feminist Takes. It's a project initiated by Antonia Majaca, which specifically focuses on Yugoslavia as a kind of uh, uh, starting point to discuss possibilities of revolutionary uh, feminism. So this is really one of the crucial characters for sure. I also would like to say that Anna Janevsky, who mentioned at the beginning that uh, she, start, uh, she started to think about Zilnik within the context of uh, amateur cine clubs, we invited her for this version of the exhibition that opens tomorrow to curate uh, a section of the exhibition that really specifically looks into his involvement in cine clubs and in a whole artistic scene of Yugoslavia at the time which had many different facets, but which were kind of background against which Jelimir work and very specific approach was also uh, possible. Uh, I would like now maybe to open to the questions from the audience, but also would like to announce that uh, Jelimir is actually with us tonight. So I would like to invite also Jelimir to join us and we can also ask him questions as well. Is it possible? Is Jelimir somewhere here? Yes, there they are. <laughs> you know, group of our, the rest of VHV and a uh, lot of our collaborators and colleagues, not a lot, I mean, as much as allowed, the gathered in Kunsthalle. Hello, Jelimir. Hello, hello. Hello to everybody. It's wonderful to have you here. <laughs> Well, first I would like to thank really all of you because I understood that you know about my film much more than I do. And you did such an excellent uh, analyzing of the topics, which maybe uh, in many cases I felt uh, only subconsciously, not, uh, not uh, so, uh, I would say, uh, nicely uh, ex uh, to be to be able to expose it so nicely as you do so thank you very much and of course i thank very much uh, to uh, first of all the, the team of curator and uh, team of kunsthalle for organizing this exhibition and also uh, edit Ruth, Ruth house and the uh, uh, leaders of that institution we have heard as they made this first exhibition. And that is really, uh, for me, uh, a huge surprise. I never, I never dreamt that even uh, one can find a form to present all these uh, uh, dozens of film on such a unique and, and intriguing uh, new, uh, like way, uh, I had, uh, I was even uh, again surprised when I came uh, two days ago in uh, Kunsthalle, this huge space, I thought, thought you're going to be lost there, but you really have found some excellent method how to structure uh, the things. We ho I hope that also the people who will come uh, would uh, understand it. And for me, it's interesting uh, that also many of the films which have been more or less forgot, forgotten or put aside, you, uh, you, you took and you have chosen. So for me, that was also uh, quite unique to see some of my pieces, which I did not uh, see for 50 years, especially those which I made for television. Uh, then, uh, of course, uh, uh, I would like to, to thank very much to Sarita, as she was helping me in digging uh, in archive and collecting and finding all these materials and photos. And then she did actually the most of communication uh, for, for preparing uh, the, the texts and the event. Uh, if you... Uh, would uh, maybe uh, like to hear a few uh, thoughts of mine about uh, actually how uh, 
I see now in retrospective all these 50 years of my work, I must tell you uh, that uh, definitely very young, I was uh, actually very much uh, enthusiastic uh, 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 watching various films as in this early 50s, the films on, in the cinemas was the only one window, only one hour window into the world, into the globe, into, into the planet, you see? There was no television, there was actually uh, uh, no interest in newspapers, nothing, nothing. But luckily, Yugoslavia, after the break with Soviet Union, uh, had this moment of very open cultural politics. So in normal cinema, we have seen uh, Italian neorealism, we have seen new French uh, uh, way, we have seen even Brazilian film, we, we, have seen, we, we have seen, you know, Scandinavian films. And uh, my first feeling was this fascinating tool and art is something we will never be able to come near to. And then, of course, I, when I entered the kino club scene, uh, very quickly we could uh, pass through this complicated technique and, and you know, material uh, like, a, uh, like a film stock and everything, but uh, possibilities for, for, for making something uh, more complicated, did not exist. And uh, by actually getting to know Makavev and Zhivoy and Pavlovich, and Sasha Petrovich and uh, Pulisha Georgievich and the others, and also people from Kino Club, I got a chance to, to be invited to be assistant of director in Avala Film, which was in that moment very huge uh, place for co production and so on. And in that moment, I understood that actually I must do something different and opposite. I, I felt that film is also in these poor countries, uh, uh, actually a structure of manipulation, you see, because you need this uh, funding of the state, you need a good connection with politicians. You see, in, in our films, you have had these, you know, generals and politicians marching around beside, of course, um, big actors, uh, and, uh, and you know, directors. And I think that out of this distance, which I wanted to, 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 to make by finding some, some uh, my own uh, ground where I will uh, feel comfortable, came to, to this approach of mine. And that approach was actually uh, observing and listening more than uh, uh, imposing uh, the, the, the knowledge and the story. So in all films which I made, when I finished the movie, I knew much more about uh, destinies, characters, participants, and the topic than in a, in a moment when I start making the film. I always started uh, from, from some uh, feeling and some inspiration that uh, just, I want to capture the moment uh, we are living in, in and the frustration and tensions which we cannot solve and we cannot understand. So those small things, you see, when we went uh, uh, in the village to make this first film, uh, 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 the newsreel, uh, youth, uh, uh, living of, of youth, I, I just felt very much uncomfortable as my fellow uh, friends in the school and in studies from the villages, they have not been present in, 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 in media. They have not been the people who have had their voice. Never, never. You see, nowhere. Because uh, in that time, village was something what, what should be completely forgotten as you know, this new agricultural system and socialism is coming and this, uh, you know, private agriculture producers, they are just, uh, just the past, you see. And then that is, but I didn't, but, but I didn't know what the energy, what uh, actually joy and in the same time, uh, 
some sort of excellent uh, comment of what's going on uh, uh, lays, uh, lays in those uh, personalities. And step by step, that is how uh, then uh, we have been um, uh, going from one film to another very soon. Uh, Came, uh, from, came a, a, a very important lecture, a lecture for, for me, and that is this political pressure on some of the films, like early works, but also on some of the short films. So I understand, I understand the society much more than if I would not have been under that pressure, you see. So even, even this uh, debate when I was put out of the party, that was interesting one. It was, it was not how it is now, uh, uh, thought it is, it is really some sort of clarity between dogmatism and some approach which was uh, uh, trying to, to trace these promises and, and, and ideas of this specific Yugoslav communism. And you have seen that against that idea, there is actually the army and cloud of bureaucracy who doesn't want it, who are trying to find a way how to just brush off everything from, you know, uh, from Karl Marx to, you know, Rosa Luxemburg and so on and so on. And so you see that you have then something where you have uh, very really have a reason to fight for. So <clears throat> that is how it went. And also all this experience in Germany, that was, that was interesting for me because they pretended that they are open and you know everything is free and and then when you when you just touch some points of that society uh, which is forbidden also and ideologically forbidden it comes out so directly and uh, how would I say strong so uh, all together I thank you very much <laughs> <laughs> thank you <laughs> Thanks a lot. Uh, there are a few questions from the audience. Some of them are already discussed in the chat, uh, but some of them we can also we, we can also raise. Uh, maybe people who pose questions can just turn on the camera also and yeah. ask them if they feel comfortable with this. Anna, would you like to ask about the praxis? Your question about praxis philosophy. Okay, I'm reading the question is from uh, Anna Devic, one of uh, member of VHV. It's basically for Boris, no? Uh, yes, yes, it is obviously for me, but yeah. all the questions, shall I uh, read it? Um, uh, the sixties were the time of the res oops, resurgence uh, uh, of interesting class as praxis, notably also for the praxis group of intellectuals in Yugoslavia and elsewhere, with the accompanying crucial concepts of alienation. How would you link, compare, contrast Zilnik's concepts of uh, conceptions of class to that of contemporary praxis academics? Um, which one proved to be more <laughs> durable, true? Uh, uh, I, I think in the 60s, the discourse on class was, to was totally uh, occupied by the official politics. So that the move of the praxis philosophers to the early works, Marx's early works, was sort of a critique of ideology, uh, of, of a concept of class being ideologically alienated from the praxis of revolution. So this is probably generally the concept of, of praxis philosophers. Uh, they, however, uh, haven't, uh, didn't uh, at that time develop any sort of consistent theory of, of class. Zilnik, however, practically works with the class, not only practically, methodologically, uh, uh, <laughs> uh, sublates, or this is, this is he, what, what his work uh, uh, is about, trying to sublate this divide between intellectual labor and you know, physical labor. This is such a crucial and, and deep level of, of, the, of a class division. And he has been working his whole life on this, on this div division. So of course, his concept has 
<laughs> of class, uh, which is the praxis of working and changing and praxis of articulating and addressing this deep divide, which is older than you know, capitalism. This is what he has been doing uh, from the very beginning until nowadays. Praxis philosophy has in these terms no uh, much to that. It is, but of course, concepts of praxis is very important. Concepts of alienation is very important, but it has very much to do with Heidegger. It has very much to do with Frankfurt School critique of the cultural industry, which is also important for, but, but let's say, yes, uh, Zilnik has always been a uh, believer in class, but we cannot say this for the, for the uh, uh, praxis philo philosophers, even if they in, uh, uh, implicitly in the name of the working class criticize bourgeois uh, counter revolutions and nationalism, for instance. Hope thank you. I'm, thank you. Um, this is very important. I'm sorry, I cannot turn on my camera because it says that the host has turned it off, but it's really not important. Uh, so this failure of uh, academic approaches is, is extremely important in comparison to film as a method. Um, so I very much appreciate it, but I think it goes also a little bit beyond um, what other people were saying, but I really appreciate it. And I hope this is going to be recorded. So, because I'm working on these issues, so I can remind myself further. And Boris, maybe I can also ask you a few questions later on. Okay. Thanks much. Thank you, Anna. Also, of course, I didn't know that you are not Anadevich. Yeah, that is, that is, that is, uh, there are just two Anna Davich that I know, but that's just how it is. <laughs> <laughs> nice to meet another Anna Davich. Okay. Uh, I would also maybe like to ask all of the panelists to turn on the cameras, please, if it's possible. It will just uh, be easy. Yes, thank you. It'll be easier for us to talk. Uh, there is also a question from Victor S. Can we say, maybe Victor wants to pose the question himself. If not, I will read it. Can we say that Jeremy's films, if you see them as a political project, were a TV bound political project that has expired? Can you see the question in the chat? There is no doubt that they give account to the past but with the vanishing of TV and the rise of YouTube, we are nowadays only bothered with recommendations that are similar to things that we already like, meaning people who might not know of and were accidentally confronted with his films on TV are out of reach now. Does anyone, does anybody want to uh, answer on this? Has any proposal for an answer? I might, uh, uh, I might just like very, very simple uh, 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 um, address the problem, which is deeply about uh, technological change and technology. Uh, as far as I know, Zilnik and his work, um, he, you know, the, the question is, uh, and uh, I mentioned uh, Bernard Stigler, uh, he, he uses the notion of pharmakon, which is old Greek, you know, uh, for both, for poison and the cure. And Derrida also wrote about it. So this is, this is how we can think of also film and media technology. Yes, TV is out, but there is a YouTube. However, whether YouTube will <laughs> be a poison of cure, this depends on us. But the, and this makes uh, Zilnik's work even more important because he gives us some sort of, of uh, uh, you know, knowledge. He tra transfers so, uh, certain critical knowledge on, on how to uh, include people in, in, in technology, how to include politics, how to include social divisions, social concepts, um, uh, because in the very, at the very core of his work is a human being activating his or her abilities to make films, to participate in public, in, in media, to be the subject of the media representation and not object. This is something where we can see that, that uh, uh, regardless of 
what sort of new technology is offered, there is a chance to approach it and to use it from an emancipatory uh, perspective. Yes, if I can add to this, because I also mentioned television, um, I'm not sure that I completely understood um, um, the statement that uh, the project of doing something for television has expired. Um, uh, but to the uh, like in the way that I understood it, it made mean that the tell the traditional understandings of television have changed. But that doesn't mean that it's expired. Old media are in, included in new media. So I think that the way that Jelimir talks about working on television and I actually was going through the book to find that page, um, it's page 139. Um, television has the possibility to constantly investigate the fundamental value of our society, which is diversity. Um, I think with the proliferation of new media and new technologies that are accessible, um, I think uh, we may criticize it in many different ways. And of course, there's, uh, there's a lot to criticize, but the question of accessibility of who gets to put their hands on a camera or uh, how uh, we access content and the accessibility of content has changed in significant ways that um, are sort of echoing the accessibility of television in, in certain other periods of time. So there, I, I see there a connection and continuation of something that television used to be with respect to the, uh, the, the uh, accessibility, um, uh, both for the, for the makers of the content and of the viewers of the content, which is not to say again, that there's not a lot more complicated things uh, that are worrying going on, but at the same time, I don't see it as a break of television has become irrelevant. It is, it is mutated or evolved, if you will, whatever term you want to use. Uh, into these new forms that we currently uh, are kind of overwhelmed with. But I think Jelimir in his more recent work has utilized yet again um, um, to be able to continue to make his films on whatever budget um, is um, as he, at his disposal. Yeah, I think if, if I can jump in, I think that's really a key point, which you, the, the, the final thing you just mentioned, Diana, we also have to remember, obviously, that there's a reason that Zilnik went into television. Um, it wasn't by chance, and it wasn't necessarily by choice. It was by choice because he had an opportunity um, to get his hands on equipment, to get his hands on, on crews, and also to be able maybe to go places where, where other film crews or, or other larger productions couldn't go. But there's a reason, and that reason is obviously doors were closed to him uh, in, in terms of the feature film production world for political reasons, for ideological reasons, um, in some cases, maybe even for creative reasons. The interesting thing also about Zilnik, when we talk about technology, whether we talk about the Kino Club moment when he was working on 16 millimeter, whether we talk about his early short documentary films where in some cases he was working on 35 millimeter and features on 35. When we talk about That's his television work, particularly when we talk about this moment now where he's shooting on digital video, um, whether it's because of budget or, or whatever reason, it's with him, it's always, it's it's not about the technology so much. It's a very unpretentious way of working. And it's very much about his 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 figures, his his the people that he's involved with. And he's very fluid in the way he works and how he works, not beholden to any particular strategy or any particular politics of respectability. Because obviously when he was working in television, a lot of Sydney ass would look sort of down their nose at him and at that in general, like, okay, this is not even cinema. What are we even talking about? Um, and that's where Zilnik thrives and those margins and those sort of disrespected sort of disconcerted areas. That's where he's at his best and doing his best work. And I would add it's because he's not interested in film, but in communism, but so he doesn't really care. How is it happening? Thank you. Thank you, Greg, for this comment also. Uh, I think we can end here. I would like to thank you all. It's a great uh, ending line, uh, <laughs> Natasha, so. <laughs> no, I mean, we are with time, it's, we are <laughs> done. Uh, thank you all participants. Thank you all who joined us for this Zoom. Thank you, Jelimir, like always. And uh, I hope you will have a chance to see the book, to get the book, and I also invite you, whoever, can to visit the exhibition. 
that open that miraculously opens tomorrow. Thank you all very much. Thank, thank you. Thank you for inviting me. Bye bye.